Hello and welcome to the very first issue of Ruckus Rules. Come join me while I walk you through how to play Rise to Nobility. In this magical land of heroes, villains, and adventurers, a fragile peace has been brokered between the five realms. Five years have passed since the evil Lord Dranor escaped from the Cavern Tavern. The elf princess Tabitha Orestes has taken her rightful place as the High Queen of the Five Realms and has built a new capital, the White Walled City of Cape Horn. To begin setup of Rise to Nobility, place the main board and then place the scoreboard nearby. Then place the round marker on space one of the round track. Now shuffle the ship tiles and place them face down near the board and flip the top tile over and place it face up near the port. Shuffle the stone council tiles and place one in each space in the stone council. Place the remaining tiles face down nearby. Place the goods, modifier, tokens, and coins near the board within reach of all players. Next, search the setup cards for the one marked with your player count and lay it near the board for reference later. Take the settler's cards and separate the ones with the one on the back from the ones with the two on the back. Each player then randomly draws one card from the deck marked with the one on the back. Now shuffle both decks together to form one big deck. Lay six of them face up near the cavern tavern and place the remaining cards face down nearby. If playing with one or two players, search the building tiles for one workshop from each guild and place it on the center space for that guild. Finally, place all remaining building tiles in the bag, shuffle them up, and draw six placing one on each space in the guild hall. If playing with four, five, or six players, player four gets one modifier token, player five gets two, and player six gets three. Also, if playing with six players, you must use the Chancery expansion, and you must place one additional space on the White Castle. To set up the player areas, each player will do the following. Choose a color and take the dice, meeples, houses, and markers of that color. Next, take a player board and a reference card. Place one of your houses on the construction platform on your player board, and place the remainder of your houses along with your meeples off to the side. Take eight coins and one good of each type. Randomly choose a card from the character card deck, then take your reputation marker, place it on nine on your reputation track, your nobility marker and place it on zero on the nobility track, and your score marker and place it on your colored zero on the score track. The first player marker goes to whoever most recently moved to a new house or apartment, or you can just roll one die each to see who goes first. In Rise to Nobility, you play a landowner trying to become a lord. Gain victory points by buying buildings, housing settlers, and fulfilling various demands from the Stone Council. At the end of 10 rounds, the person with the most victory points replaces Burke the Clerk at the head of the Stone Council and wins the game. At the beginning of each round, each player rolls all five of their dice. Then, starting with the first player and moving in clockwise order, players take turns completing any or all of the following actions in any order. Place the die. Complete a Settler's card. Sell a building. In Rise to Nobility, the value on the dice that you roll determine where you can put those dice. And your reputation determines the maximum cumulative value of all the dice that you are allowed to play in one round. Many places on the board have three spaces on them, including the Guilds, Burke the Clerk's Office, the Stone Council, and the White Castle. In these locations, the first space allows for a 1 or 2 value die, the second space allows for a 3 or 4 value die, and the third space allows for a 5 or 6 value die. The only one of these spaces that is a little bit different is the Stone Council, which we will cover later. Each of the guilds represents a different good that you can collect in the game. When placing a die in a guild, place the die in an available space and take the following actions. First, activate any workshops in the guild, starting with the first one to the left and moving to the right until you reach the space directly above the die you've just placed. For instance, if you place a 3 or a 4 in the second space, you may activate a workshop above the first space and then the workshop above the second space. The workshops have various icons on the bottom of the tile to indicate what reward you're allowed to receive. Gain a coin, gain a free good from this guild, reroll any or all of your dice, Swap any good from your player board with another good from the supply. Purchase for one coin one good of any type. Increase your reputation by one. On any tile with two icons separated by a slash, you may choose one of the two options to take. After activating all available workshops, you may purchase up to the number of goods printed on the space where you placed your die for one coin each. 
For instance, if you placed your die on the second spot, you may purchase one or two of the goods from that guild. If you choose to buy at least one good, you may gain one free good for every apprentice you have in that guild. Finally, if you placed your die in one of the first two spots, you may place up to the number of meeples printed on that spot in an available apprentice slot in that guild. Meeples may be placed from the worker slot on your player board or from any other apprentice slot on any other guild. Reference the setup card for how many spaces are allowed to be used each round in each guild. The total number of available apprentice slots in each guild is equal to the number of players. In the center of the board is Burke the Clerk's Office. When placing a die in Burke the Clerk's Office, you may take one free modifier token. Then, if you place your die in the second or third slot, you may choose to purchase for one coin each up to the number of modifier tokens printed in that slot. Finally, you may optionally choose to discard all of the cards in the Cavern Tavern and replace them with new ones, or discard all remaining building tiles in the Guild Hall and draw new ones to place in all available slots. All three slots in Burke the Clerk's Office are available at all player counts. At the White Castle, whenever you place a die in one of the available slots, increase your reputation by the number shown on that slot. Your new reputation takes effect immediately. All three slots in the White Castle are available at all player counts. To fulfill a Stone Council tile, look at the image to the left of the row and at the bottom of the column. You must place a die that matches one of the two dice pictured to the left, and you must have fulfilled a Settler card for the race that is represented at the bottom of the column. And you must have reached at least the point on the nobility track of the shield represented on that tile. So to fulfill a Stone Council tile with a white shield on it, you must have at least reached the white shield spot on the nobility track. Spin the goods and coins represented on the tile, pick up the tile and replace it with your die, and increase your victory points by the number shown on the tile. Then lower your reputation by 2. In the top left of the board is the Cavern Tavern. The leftmost die space has no numerical requirement, but dice placed in any other space must be greater than or equal to all previously placed dice. Therefore, if a 5 is placed, the next die must be either a 5 or a 6. The number below each die slot represents the minimum player count for which that space is available. Once you've placed a die, you may collect any one of the 6 face-up settler cards. Place it in your player area and then immediately replace it with the top card from the settler deck. The construction yard in the top right of the board is much like the Cavern Tavern, in that the first die placed can have any value, and every die placed after that must be less than or equal to all dice placed before it. Therefore, if a 4 is placed, the next die must be 4, 3, 2, or 1. After placing a die in the construction yard, spend 5 coins and collect 1 house from your supply and place it on the construction platform on your player board. The final two locations have 6 spaces in which to place specific dice. After placing a die in an available slot at the port, you may sell a number of goods up to the number shown on that die. The ship tile at the port represents the amount of each good that can be sold and the amount of coins that each good is worth. Place that good on an empty slot representing that good on the ship. Then collect a number of coins displayed to the right of that good row for each good of that type that was sold. For instance, if you laid a 3, you could place 1 red and 2 yellow and gain 3 coins for the red and 2 coins for each yellow, totaling 7 coins. All goods sold in a round stay on the ship until the end of the round, and a player may not place a good on a space where a player has already placed a good. Finally, after placing a die in the guild hall, pay the number of coins displayed below, and take the building and place it in its appropriate spot. To buy a workshop, you must have at least one apprentice in an apprentice slot in the guild represented on that workshop. Place the workshop in the leftmost available slot on that guild, and take your apprentice and place it on that workshop to note that that workshop is yours. Move your nobility marker one space up the nobility track for each star pictured on the bottom left of the space where you place the workshop, and increase your score by the number shown in the bottom right of that space. When a workshop you own is activated by a player other than yourself, you gain the reward pictured above that workshop. To buy a community building, you must have a worker in the worker slot on your player board and an available slot on your board in which to put it. Place the tile in an available slot on your player board. Place a meeple from your worker slot onto that building. Move your marker two spaces up the nobility track and gain five victory points. Once your nobility marker has reached or passed the purple shield, immediately gain the reward listed on your character card. Players may also place a five or six value die in the top right corner of their player board to return an apprentice to the worker slot. At any point during their turn, players may also choose to complete a settler's card. 
To complete a settler's card, you must spend the appropriate number of goods from your supply. In the top left of each settler's card, there are two numbers, one with a blue background and one with a red background. The number with the red background represents the minimum number of goods needed to fulfill the settler's card. And the top number with the blue background represents the maximum number of goods that can be spent to fulfill the card. At the bottom of the card are icons for two to four goods. You must spend at least one of each of the goods pictured, and may not spend more than three of any one good. The only exception is the good that is represented in the top left of your character card. For that good, you may spend up to four on a single card. After spending the required amount of goods, move a house to an available slot on your player board and increase your score by one for every good spent, plus one for each community building on your player board. Gain the number of meeples pictured on the top right of your card, and if there are any stars on the top right of your card, move your marker up the nobility track one space for each star pictured there. On your turn, you may choose to sell a building for three coins. To do so, lower your score by the number showed on the space under the building, return your meeple to your worker's lot on your player board, and, if selling a community building, discard that building. Players may continue taking turns until they have used up all of their dice, or laying one more die would increase the collective value of all their dice used that round higher than their reputation. At that point, a player must pass. Once all players have passed, move to the income phase. In the income phase, players receive coins for each apprentice in a guild. Refer to the setup card to determine how many coins each apprentice will receive according to the total number of apprentices in that guild. Next, for each workshop that you own, gain one good from that guild. Finally, for each community building that you own, gain the reward shown directly above that building. Now, return all of your dice to your player board, return goods sold on the ship to the supply, replace the ship tile with the top tile from the stack, Fill any empty slots in the stone council starting with the top row from left to right. If there are any empty spaces in the guild hall, slide the remaining buildings to the left to fill in any gaps, and draw tiles to fill the remaining spaces from left to right. Finally, pass the first player marker to the left and advance the round marker to begin the next round. At the end of the tenth round, the game is over. Players may score one additional point for every two goods that remain in their supply regardless of type. Then, add any victory points marked on the space on the nobility track that you reached. Players on the white shield gain 6 victory points. Whoever has the highest score at this point is the winner. If there is a tie, the winner is the player with the most houses built. If there is still a tie, the player with the highest reputation. In the unlikely event of another tie, the player with the most coins. And, if there is still a tie, all tied players win. I hope you enjoyed this walkthrough of the rules of Rise to Nobility. Feel free to write in the comments below and let me know what you thought of this video as well as any other content that you'd like to see on this channel. I'll see you next time. Until then, Ruckus rests.